So last week we talked about um, Bloom's taxonomy and we talked about elevating the level of our instruction to those higher levels of that pyramid, right? And so there's been a quote that's been going around for a long time um, that says Maslow's before Bloom's. And so Maslow has a hierarchy. A hierarchy is like a taxonomy. Um, you know, teachers, we like to use fancy words, right? So Maslow created a hierarchy of needs. And what he said is, before we even start, before we even try to teach children, we need to look at their needs. Are their needs being met? Are there um, are there are they able to function because their needs are being met? Right, and this really goes back to what we've talked about: children in poverty, children of low income. Um, so this is Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So Abraham Maslow um, was a psychologist who studied positive human qualities, um, and he created this hierarchy of needs. Um, and he said that these are the things that motivate people. And so he said the most basic needs that we have are physiological. We need to breathe. We need food. We need water, sex, sleep, homeostasis, and excretion. Now, obviously, these are things that we need in varying amounts at varying points in our life. But if I have a student who is growing up in poverty, who does not have access to food and water, school becomes far less important. If I have a student who is experiencing health issues and or, you know, let's say a student with asthma who their parents can't afford to buy them their medication. If I'm struggling to breathe, I could care less about diagramming a sentence. Um, if you have a student who has a difficult home life, um, you know, parents are fighting all the time or there's a lot of violence, um, there's anything that would disrupt their life. If I can't excuse me, if I can't sleep, then I don't, I don't care about solving for X. And so these psychological needs are the foundation of Maslow's hierarchy. He says, we need the physiological needs to be met first. Okay. Then he says, then we need to talk about our safety security of the body, of employment, of resources, of morality, of the family, of health, and of property. And so especially in the times that we're in right now, and I hate, you know, to say in these unprecedented times, right? You know that that's one of my least favorite phrases. But in these unprecedented times, we have students that are living and engaged in a life that involves a lot of fear, right? Um, you know, our children, our students don't feel necessarily safe um, or secure of body. You know, I and you guys know, I don't mind sharing, you know, what's going on with with my kids. My little one is worried she's going to get sick. Her teacher's going to get sick, um, that she's going to get sick at school and bring it home to us. You know, that's a fear. She does not have security of body right now. OK. Um, of employment. Now, your students might not be the ones that are employed, but if their um, if their parents are dealing with unemployment, um, if their parents are dealing with, I'm going to be evicted, they're going to repossess my car, um, I can't pay for the electricity. Um, all of those are uh, safety of resources, and those kinds of fears can affect kids a lot. Um, and so we don't think about it. And, and I'm going to say, I'm a, I, you know, I'm going to make an assumption that for the most part, we don't worry about those things. Right. Um, I'll tell you that growing up, there were times that I came home from school and there was no electricity. Um, you know, it got to the point where when I was in high school, if I if I saw the lights off when I got home off of the late bus, I knew that we didn't have any electricity. Um, but at that point, I was in high school. I was probably spending 75% of my day at school anyway. So it, it wasn't, yes, it affected me, but not to the point where it was hindering me in school, right? I was still able to get things done at school. Um, but that kind of issue with safety, it's not good for your students psychologically, right? These are going to be kids that you see that 
you know, are hoarding pencils, hoarding crayons. Um, if you give out a snack, they want to. Um, I saw this a lot when I worked at the elementary that when other kids were clearing their plate, they would ask for the rolls or they would ask for the fruit um, and they'd put it in their pockets to take home or to eat later um, because they didn't have that security. Um, they didn't know where their next meal was coming from. They didn't know, is there going to be food when I get home? Um, am I going to, am I going to be evicted from the apartment with my family? Um, and so, so safety is a big issue because your brain in survival mode does react differently than when you feel comfortable and safe. Um, studies have shown that um, if you expose maternal rats to stress during their pregnancy, um, then the, the infant rats tend to be underweight. They tend to be more aggressive um, because when you're stressed, your body releases a certain kind of hormone into your brain. Um, and it puts you in survival mode and that's, uh, it, it impacts your whole system. And so, you know, safety is a big one. I would, I would say safety is equally as important as, a, as a physiological. Um, because if, if I'm trying to survive, I don't care about math. Um, if I'm trying to make sure that I have a meal on the weekend when I'm not at school, I don't care about history. Um, and so safety is, is really important. And so then our next one after safety um, is love and belonging. And so love and belonging deals with friendship, family, intimate, uh, and sexual intimacy. Now, here's where people tend to get stuck. I do. Um, and people say, well, you know, if I teach kinder, you know, how am I teaching my students about sexual intimacy? We tend to focus on the sexual part of it, but intimacy is really important for children. Um, and it's that feeling of security. It builds on that feeling of security. If you've ever gone somewhere with a child and I'm talking like, you know, even I would even say seven, eight years old. If you're, if you go some, if you go somewhere with a kid, they want to hold your hand. Um, sometimes even if you've just met this child, they want to hold your hand. Um, because that's intimacy. That's saying you make me feel safe. And so I want to be attached to you in some way. Um, because physically, physical contact makes me feel safe. Um, and so, so yes, you can have intimacy with, um, you know, with younger children. Um, now, obviously, if we're talking about older kids, like high school kids, you know, we always want to be careful. And, and I say high school, but I really mean all, all grades, right? Um, you know, we need to be careful with how we're touching children with, you know, are they comfortable? Are they uncomfortable? And really that goes for anybody, right? How, how we should be touching people. Um, but we can still provide feelings of intimacy with how we talk to people, right? Um, if every time you ask me a question, I blow you off, I'm not making you feel loved. And I'm not making you feel like you belong. Um, you know, if I if I don't have a sense of community in my classroom, I'm not making you feel like you belong. Um, you know, one of the one of the things that I hated when I was an administrator um, was I had a teacher that would say the the students would argue they would fight about pencils um, because she had these like cool neon pencils and. Um, you know, miss, he has my pencil and no, this is my pencil and whatever. And she would say, nothing in here is yours. Everything is mine. Well, how do I, how can I feel like I belong if you're telling me that I'm a stranger in this classroom, um, that I'm a visitor in this classroom? And so, so that, that's not great, right? Uh, that's not going to help children feel like they belong and like they're loved. Um, friendships are important. If you're If you're considering working at the elementary level, one of the things that you'll have to think about is how do I teach my children? How do I teach my students to make friends, right? Um, because we're all socialized differently. Um, we are all raised differently. And so, um, you know, I remember growing up, 
my mom would, you know, I, if we went out to lunch somewhere and we saw like a police officer or fireman or, you know, anybody in a uniform and we would say, Oh, who is that? And I wonder what they do and whatever. My mom was one of those people. It's like, well, go ask them, go up to them and ask them. And, and so, you know, we, we were raised in a way that nobody was a stranger. Um, if we wanted to know something, then get up and go ask. And, um, and so I think that that's translated into to who I am as an adult, right? I don't know a stranger. I just know, you know, um, people that I haven't met and that I haven't, you know, gotten to know yet. Um, there are some children that are, that are not going to be comfortable speaking with others. And so you want to, um, you want to figure out how do I teach friendship? How do I teach community? How do I teach that we are a family in this classroom? Um, and so that's something that you'll have to think about because that loving that love and belonging is really important to having your classroom run with a sense of community, um, with a sense of unity. Um, and so that's really, really important for, um, for children. So then you have esteem. Okay. And so self-esteem, confidence, achievement, respect of others, respect by others. Um, and so we, and I'm going to say we collectively, this tends to be where we struggle. Um, we're really good at building the esteem of others. Um, and I've, I've seen you guys do it. Um, you know, one of you will come into class and you're like, oh, I, I, you know, I look, I'm broken out. I feel, you know, schlumpy, whatever. And somebody will say, no, you're so pretty. You're so smart. You know, like we're really good at pumping up other people. Um, we're typically not good at pumping ourselves up. And so, you know, I would challenge you to, if you're going to build up the self-esteem of somebody else, you know, find find positive things to say about yourself. And I know it's super cheesy. Um, I know you've, I, I know everybody has ended up on motivation TikTok, um, where it's all positive and, and, you know, girl, you can do it. And, you know, here's my motivation story and whatever I've been on motivation TikTok. Um, and so, but it's true. It's absolutely true that we need to um, make sure that that voice in our head is a positive voice. Um, and if we can't, then we need to help others that have that negative voice, you know, dr almost drown it out with our positive. Um, and so esteem is about helping others have respect, show respect, um, have confidence, self-esteem. Where we tend to struggle also with this is false esteem. Okay. So I'm going to, I'm going to give you an example. Let's say that, uh, Luis and Matthew, uh, are going to run a race, right? I don't know why they would run, but they're going to run a race. And, uh, and Matthew is able to run the mile in seven minutes. And Luis has never run a mile before. He doesn't know, but he's pretty sure he's faster than Matthew, right? He's, He's got it. He feels good about himself. Um, so they run this race and Matthew finishes his mile in seven minutes. And it's been 10 minutes and Luis is still running. And it's been 11 minutes and he's still running. And so 14 minutes later, Luis finishes his mile. And so, you know, we, you know, it was a race, right? So there's a winner. And so we say, okay, Matthew, congratulations. Here's your gold medal. And for Luis, here's your silver medal. And Luis says, oh, I'm the second fastest runner uh, at the race. Well, yes and no, right? So yes, technically, he's the second fastest runner. Um, but there was only two runners, right? And so that's false esteem. Um, you know, it's, it's, and there's all kinds of arguments in both directions. Um, but it's like participation ribbons. Um, you know, here's your trophy for showing up today. And so you're going to want to think about how do you promote that in your classroom? What is, what is important that you're building in your students? Um, is it important that you're building the, the, we try and if we fail, we get up and try again. 
Um, is it important that you're building? We try and, you know, we get a reward no matter what. You're, you're going to want to think about those things because, um, you know, I, I'm not the first person to tell you this, but not everybody gets a cookie in the real world, right? Not everybody gets a gold medal in the real world. Um, so you want to make sure that you're not confusing self-esteem and confidence and achievement with false esteem. Um, because those are the people that, that um, are posting on Facebook uh, that they know better than doctors, you know, because they YouTubed it or whatever. Um, so that is esteem. Guys, nobody has anything like exciting to, to tell me about these things. Nobody has like a story or a... Y'all are real focused today. <laughs> Susan, have you been on Motivation TikTok yet? Oh, you need to you need to stop liking those videos. Exactly. Yeah, we need to start sending Betsy our motivation TikToks. Yeah, there's um All right. Well, you know what? Send Susan your TikTok and then she can send it to me and we'll send you motivation TikToks. You know what? I'm I am on um crafting TikTok. That's where I'm at right now. Because I've been crafting yeah, small business I'm in small business TikTok and true crime TikTok. Yeah. Well, we'll get you on the right side of TikTok, Betsy. Uh huh. You're like, how did I, what did I click on to get here? Um, well, I've been, so I've been, I'm teaching that forensics class. So I've been looking up like little tips for how to do certain activities and stuff. And that's how I ended up on true crime TikTok. All right. So let's talk about the top of the pyramid. And so the top of the pyramid obviously is our goal, right? We want everyone on the top of the pyramid, students, teachers, everybody. And so the top of the pyramid is about self-actualization. Um, this is who you really are, um, you know, who, being your best self, right? All of those, all of those cringy words that, um, that we hear in motivation TikTok. Um, so this is about having morality and knowing what your morals are, right? It's not a universal morality. Um, it may be that you're cool with something that I'm not cool with. Um, it's your creativity. And again, it's not a universal creativity. You know, Luis and Kim, super into music. I do arts and crafts. Um, Susan plays a ukulele. Everybody has different things that they're creative in. Um, spontaneity, you know, and spontaneity really is, it's about flexibility. Um, it's about, you know, losing some of that rigidity that we tend to get into when we're comfortable with stuff. Um, it's lack of pre prejudice. Um, you know, being able to accept yourself and because you can accept yourself, you can accept others. Um, and then acceptance of facts. And it's understanding that just because you don't agree with something or something is not the way you want, doesn't mean that it hurts you, doesn't mean that you're wrong. Uh, or I'm sorry, doesn't mean that that you're somehow less. It just means that, you know, that's those are the facts and they don't fit what it is that you want. And so self-actualization is the goal now i'm going to tell you a terrible secret 
you are most likely not to reach self-actualization until you are around 25 to 30 years old. And I'm going to tell you why. So remember that we talked about brain development in the past. So your brains are not really fully formed until you're about 22, 23. Um, some of you will form faster. Some of you will form slower. That's just the way it rolls. Um, and so then you have to give that fully formed brain time to figure out who it is, right? Um, now, here's the other layer that we put on top of this is that most people before they're 30 have found a partner, um, have gotten married, have started a career, you know, maybe started a family. And so you're going through a lot of changes really fast. Um, and so those changes can impact your esteem, your feeling of love and belonging, your feeling of safety. Um, and then you have to work on those bottom layers first. Um, you have to have the, the physiological foundation before you can have safety. You have to have safety before you can have love and belonging. Um, you cannot be a self-actualized person who uh, is not physiologically secure. Um, you know, the, they build one on the other. Um, and so, so yeah, there's the, the road is ahead of you. You know, I want y'all to understand that it's okay right now when you're 16, 17, 18, for you not to know what you want, um, for you, you know, to have these feelings of, you know, am I good enough? Am I, you know, am I smart enough? Do I feel good about myself? You know, what do I believe in? What do I not believe in? Um, because I can tell you, I, and and I've mentioned this before, the person I was in high school is not the person I was in college, is not the person I was 10 years ago. Um, and so you're going to be continuously adjusting these things, right? And there may be times where your safety base gets weak. And then you struggle with love and belonging and esteem and self-actualization. There might be times where your love and belonging gets weak um, and that impacts your self-esteem. And so this is not set one time and it's there forever. Um, this is something that you're constantly going to have to be reinforcing. You know, how do I feel? Am I getting enough water? Am I getting enough sleep? You know, somebody mentioned like, we're just plants. We're plants. Are we getting sunlight? Are we getting water? Are we getting food? Um, we're, we're plants. And so, you know, you have to be checking on the physiological. This, I will tell you, um, especially for my girls, when you have children, this is usually the first thing that goes. Um, we stop taking care of ourselves to take care of others. Um, but if I cannot take care of myself, then I cannot get to these higher levels. Um, and if I can't take care of myself, I cannot provide safety for somebody else. Um, so you have to make sure that these foundations are in place uh, because it, I, I really, I really agree with that quote. You can't blooms if you don't Maslow's. Um, if I don't feel like I belong in your class, I'm not going to take the risk and do a performance. Um, if I don't feel like I'm safe in here, I'm not going to take the risk and read something that I wrote out loud. Um and so, so there's a lot of this that's tied together. So, you know, any thoughts or reflections or anything that you all want to share about Maslow? So that's kind of an evolutionary thing. Um, so we're, we're kind of conditioned to hear babies cry. Um, and so, and I, it happens to me too, um, that I'll hear a noise and I'm like instantly awake and I'm like, okay, I heard a noise. And I feel like a, like a bat because I'll like turn my head and I'm like, okay, where did the noise come from? Where did I hear it? Um, Yeah. Yeah. I can hear my kids in the hallway. Um, 
And that's because we, I sleep with my, I mean, we sleep with our door closed and I can hear them like in the hallway, getting up to go to the bathroom and then, you know, and then going back into the room, I can hear the dog. Like our dog has a, a chest harness with his tags on it. And like, if he, sometimes he'll sleep in the living room, sometimes he'll sleep in the bathroom. And if he walks down the hall, his tag jingles, I can hear him. Um, yeah, it's you, it's becomes a superpower when you're a mom. Um, but also because your brain is like, okay, I made these people and now they can't die. Like I spent a lot of energy making these people and now they can't die. You know, <laughs> um, uh, yeah, but, but it's, it's programmed into us to, you know, worry about the security and the safety of others. Um, and I think that that has been, it's been a trend in the last few years. It's, I think it's a positive trend in the last few years for people to start taking care of themselves. Um, I, I'm in a teacher group on Facebook and I thought it was so funny. Well, funny is the wrong word. Um, you know, I, I don't know what the correct word for it is, but one of, there was a, a teacher who posted, is it okay to take my medication and go to work? And I read it and I'm like, I don't understand. Like, like if I don't take my allergy medication, I'm sneezing my head off. And Luis knows like two weeks ago, I was sneezing every two minutes. It was ridiculous. Like I would like grab my mic and try to not sneeze into my mic. Um, you know, and so, so if I don't take my allergy medication, well, yeah, like I shouldn't even go to work because I'm useless. Um, and so somebody commented like, well, what kind of medication are you talking about? And she was like, well, I have anxiety and, you know, I don't know if it's okay to take my medication and go to work. And a lot of teachers were like, if you were diabetic, would you ask that question? You know, if you were, if you had a thyroid problem, would you ask that question? You wouldn't. So then why are we making it? Why is it a question? Because it deals with anxiety, right? And I think that a lot of times we teachers, we want to be superheroes, right? We feel like we need to save people. And because of that, we tend to put ourselves last. Um, you know, I know Martin and Erica would come in and they'd be like, can I have ramen? Yes, go. Can I have this? Yes, go. Right. And then there were times when I was like, okay, I don't have anything for lunch. All right. Well, I guess I'm going to have a bag of chips or I'm going to have this or I'm going to have that. Um, and not that it bothered me, but you don't think about those things. You you tend to put other people first. And we need to take care of ourselves too. Um, because I can't give you what I don't have, right? I can't make sure you're safe if I don't feel safe. I can't feel make I can't help you feel okay if I don't feel okay. Um, you know, I can't get water from an empty well. And so you need to make sure that you're taking care of yourself too. When you're a teacher. When you're living the crazy life. Anything else, guys? Are you guys how okay? So, how is everybody doing at the end of the first six weeks? So, so you're ready to drop out. Well, it's only the first six weeks, Betsy, of your senior year, right? Yeah, <laughs> um. You know, I, and I know guys, I know that this whole online deal sucks. Um, you know, I, I, this is not at all how I intended to spend this year. I don't think anybody was planning on this. Um, you know, but, but this has given you guys, I mean, you guys are going to learn how to be teachers. Like nobody else is learning how to be teachers because I am, you know, I don't know what I'm doing with online teaching. Mr. Garza and I were talking on Monday. Yeah, we were talking on Monday. Um, and he, and it's really funny because, because he and I talk about teaching, right? And we talk about our class, my classes and his classes. And um, so he was asking how this class was going. And I said, you know, I'm so disappointed. I wanted us to decorate a classroom. I wanted us, you know, to do this. I wanted us to do that. And I said, I know I'm a good teacher in person. Like, I know that if we were live, I'd be like knocking it out of the park. I said, but online, all I see is black squares with big dots on them 
and that and and I can't read faces if I don't see faces. And he's like, oh, my God. He's like, exactly. He's like, I don't know if they understand me. They don't understand me. Are they asleep? Are they dead? He's like, I can't see anybody. And I was like, right. So then you're just kind of like, okay, am I am I too slow? Am I too fast? He's like, yeah, I have no idea. It, it's you guys are are learning it and living it. And so that's how, you know, it's just, a, it's, you guys are in a whole different situation. Um, Cause I've taken online classes, but it's never been like this. So you guys are going to be extra pro when it comes to teaching. You're like, I could do anything. I graduated in 2020. <laughs> right. I survived a global pandemic and all I got with this stupid shirt. <laughs> Okay. Uh huh. Mm hmm. Uh huh. Okay. Uh huh. Right. Right. And so like, okay, so the state of Texas, I'm putting it in the chat. The state of Texas actually allows you to be trained to be a sign language instructor. Um, let me share this with you really quick. Um, so they have a prep manual that they put out for, uh, for the exam. And what they're testing you is, can you sign um, can you, you know, teach sign? And, and so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, uh, like, here's one of the questions, uh, Mr. Brackley, a teacher of intermediate EDSL, I'm sorry, ASL students arranged his first class to see a performance of a signed play by a local deaf theater troupe. The play depicts the everyday lives of deaf people in a variety of ethnic and cultural backgrounds. Um, which of the following activities would be best help Mr. Brackley prepare the class for the trip? Um, and so there's questions that deal with how do you teach ASL students? Um, so the argument has been made that only people that are deaf should teach ASL students. So here's two things. One, are there people, are there enough people that are deaf that are ASL instructors to fill that need, right? Um, and then two, are you then excluding people from that community or excluding that community from the larger education community? Um, and so, you know, and, and there's going to be people that are going to argue against everything. I mean, there are people that are going to say Hispanic students shouldn't have white instructors. Um, black students should only have black teachers. Um, you know, but we don't increase our knowledge by only exposing ourselves to the things we've always seen. Um, you know, if, if I've never heard mariachi music, then I don't know how beautiful it is. Right. If I've never heard an opera, then I don't know how, how, you know, magical and overwhelming an opera can be. Um, you know, so, so you kind of have to think about that too, is are you going to let people tell you that that's not your place? Um, cause I don't think anybody has the right to do that. You have to decide for yourself. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. 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 And, and I mean, it's like saying, okay, if I'm, if Mr. Wajardo is a health teacher, then he should be the most fit teacher on campus because he teaches health. So he should be the healthiest person on campus. You know what I'm saying? Because he teaches you how to be healthy, right? He's teaching you. So shouldn't he be the healthiest person um, or only the healthiest person should have that job? Um, you know, if Mr. Longoria is teaching economics, then he should be the richest person should teach that class. Um, you know, it's it's one of those things where you it's it's a slippery slope argument. Right. Um, so uh, like I can tell you, my little one is learning ASL and she's doing it because my father in law is losing his hearing. And so he he's losing his hearing. And she was like, well, grandpa said that he would need uh he would need to use sign language soon. So I am, um, I'm going to learn sign language. So she takes sign language classes once a week and it's for about an hour and a half. I think it's about an hour and a half on Friday afternoons. She has a sign language class. Um, and so she, she works on her signs throughout the day and things like that. There's, um, and she's, she's not deaf, but in, but her rationale is, my grandpa is going to lose his hearing and I want to still be able to talk to him. So, you know, you don't, I don't think you have to be deaf to, um, to learn sign language. It's like saying I can't support breast cancer research because I've never had breast cancer. Yeah. Oh, baby. I know that's hard. Tell me that that was a rough transition, but I'm here for it, Bits. Uh huh. You are hilarious. You are so silly. Um, so I'm going to tell you my funny story. So Sunday night, I fell out of the shower. Yeah. So I, so I have one of those showers that's a shower and a bathtub, right? And so like you have to step over. So I stepped over onto the bath mat and then the bath mat slipped. And so in an effort to catch myself, I put my hand down, but I put it into the toilet and like in the process slammed my hand. Like you can't see it in this light, but I have like all of this is bruised on my hand um, because I like slammed it into the toilet so hard. And then I kept falling and then my ribs, like I slammed my ribs into the toilet and then I slammed my knee into the floor and the whole time I was yelling. And so then I'm laying on the floor like a wet fish. And my husband comes in because he hears me yelling. He's like, what's wrong? And I was like, ah, everything hurts. Like my hand was still in the toilet. It was a mess. And so he's like, he's like, okay, well, let me help you up. Except that I'm wet, right? So he's trying to like pull me and I'm like slippery because I just got out of the shower. So I was like, just leave me alone. So he gave me a towel and I dried myself off, right? And I stood up. I dried off and I stood up, right? Because I was like, okay, I'm not going to slip again. But my hair was all wet. So he's like, go lay down in the bed so I can see what's wrong with you. So I was like, you need to dry my hair first. Dude, he dried my hair like I was a puppy. Like he just put the towel on my head and then was like rubbing my head back and forth. And I was like, you're doing it wrong. You're going to mess up my hair color. <laughs> So I got my head dried off. I go and I lay down and he was like, okay, where does it hurt? And I was like, my hand and my ribs and I'm dying. So I have like a little bruise, like a weird long bruise here on the side of my ribs. And I have a bruise on my hand, but I was like, I almost died. 
<laughs> yes. You want to be in a high school musical. That's hilarious. Because you're not moving. Okay, let me show you let me show you this bit, this picture of my hand so you can see how terrible it is. Look, all of this is bruised on my hand. Yeah. Oh, and then up here, yeah. Yeah. I messed up. Vix. Okay. And then I iced it. Oh, let me show you this. Okay, because some of you, some of you have seen this, have seen my daughter do this. Okay, check it out. Which one's the video? Look at this. The amount of space a liquid takes up. Ugh. So, yeah, she got her purple belt. No, she got her blue belt. Yeah. I'm like super proud of her. It's like awesome. But also she could beat me up. So maybe, she, maybe I didn't fall out of the shower. Maybe she beat me up. <laughs> you know, it's a cry for help, guys. I need somebody to come pick me up. <laughs> um, Probably not. I know there is when you're like elderly, like there's like elderly protective services. Um, you know, hopefully just don't raise kids that beat you up. <laughs> um, but all right, folks. So here's what I'm going to gift to my seniors. Uh, seniors, you don't have to come to class for the rest of the week, but this is Miss Brown's butt, but you have to do the daily check-in. Um, cause if you don't do the daily check-in, then I think you're missing and then I get sad and then I have to go find you. <sighs> so, um, seniors, are we okay with that? Okay. Well then you come to class and you can watch me train the juniors. What's up, Bets? Um, so I don't think you were here last week when we found out who the new Taffy Region 1 president is. Who is it, Betsy? Betsy, who is it, Betsy? Betsy, guess who it is, Bets? It's you. It's me, Betsy. Betsy, it's me. Betsy was a whole mood. She's like, no, no, I don't want it. I don't want it. And then they're like, it's a piece of cake. She's like, oh, yeah, cool. I want that. <laughs> oh, really? 
are. You're ridiculous. Are. You're ridiculous, and I am here for it. Um, so this don't have a heart attack. So this week we're meeting uh, the the directors or I'm sorry, the schools for Region One. So you know what? Let me share that with you guys because I think it's in my I think it's in my pictures. Let me see. Yeah, it should be in my photos. That's my baby dog. This is, this is my favorite one right now. Hold on. Let me share this one while I look for what I'm looking for. This is my favorite one right now. I like that one because I don't, I know. I thought it looked like Betsy. I mean, I thought it sounded like Betsy too. She doesn't really want to work today. No, it's a dog. Let's see. Come on, computer. Okay, so this is, this is what we're thinking. Y'all can see this picture, right? Okay, so I know it's a, I, I know on my side it's a little bit blurry. So on the left, you have events that are for state, which are just these two blocks, actually. Um, and then on the right, we have the national events. So these are national contests, national competitions, right? So what we're what we've been talking about is eliminating anything that requires um, for you to interact with the audience. Um, so that would eliminate breakout session. It would eliminate um, parliamentary procedure. It would eliminate professional development. Um, but also the other thing that we were talking about was eliminating anything. Um, oh, and also differentiated lesson, right? So it would it would eliminate those. Then on the national side, we talked about eliminating anything that would require you to be in close contact with somebody. So um, the career ones, obviously, because how are you going to shadow the administrator, right? How are you going to shadow um, a non-core teacher or support services? Impromptu lesson would be out. Impromptu speaking would be out. And job interview would be out. I know. Well, because if you think about it, how do we do impromptu lesson ahead of time? You know, how do I, because if I, let's say I give everybody that's impromptu lesson the topic today and the videos due tomorrow, well, now you've had more than seven minutes to prep, right? Um, and so then what we would oh, keep will. would be the non-highlighted stuff. Now, I made a concession because I was okay with it for this year to get rid of ELF. 
Um, but I am going to fight them because I think we need to keep chapter yearbook. Um, I think we need to keep portfolio. And I think we need to keep truffles. And actually, I have an idea um, for something that you guys can do for the service part of truffles. Um, and then we would keep the bulletin boards. Uh, we would keep teacher created materials, uh, the children's book, the created lecture. Um, so we didn't do this in the past, but I think it's something that we need to look at. Um, educators rising leadership and educators rising moment. And I think moment is one that I need to think about really clearly. Um, I'm actually thinking of having Betsy do this one um, or Susan. I'm not sure. I haven't decided yet. Um, but Educators Rising Moment is about the moment that you decided that you wanted to be a teacher um, and talking about what happened that made you want to be a teacher. Um, and so I think that would be a really powerful one, especially for my seniors. Um, then we've got Ethical Dilemma inside our schools, which I think would be really powerful for us um, to talk about what we're doing at our schools right now. Um, we'd still have the lesson plan. So like Marisa can still do her, her STEM one. Um, Matthew can do a humanities one if he wants to. Um, Luis can now do a lesson for art if he wants to. Um, we've still got learning challenges. We've still got public speaking. So we've got a lot. The thing is, is that we want to be able to say these were prepared ahead of time and this is just when you submit them. Um, you know, we don't want to have to be doing anything that's at the last minute. And so, um, or that you're having to do live because of technical stuff. So, no, ethical dilemma is not the same thing. They get the ethical dilemma ahead of time. Right, because it's on the spot. So if we release, like if we release the impromptu topic to you and then say, okay, you have two days to prep, that's way more time than you would have if we were doing the actual event and now we're changing the event. I know. I know that's your favorite one, but that doesn't mean you can't do something else. Um, so we're going to meet to finalize this. And then once it's finalized, then I'm going to put up the stuff so everybody can sign up. Yeah. So, uh, so Luis, let's plan for a meeting next Friday. Yeah. Yes. The 24th. All right. 23rd, 23rd, yeah. Um, yes, my love. <laughs> Ma'am, I was in the 20s 10 years ago. I'm already in the 30s right now. It's almost turkey day. Um, you know what? I'm so sad because you guys know how much I love Halloween. You know how much I love Halloween. And I think I'm going to dress up anyway. Like, I think if I'm going to be home, I'm going to have, like, an amazing Halloween costume. Freezing. Yes. You can come and I will make a Halloween baggie for you. <laughs> yeah, the home is brown. Yeah, it's recorded. It's awkward. <laughs> I'm going to share my location for one hour. All right, children, listen, enjoy the rest of your day. Seniors, enjoy the rest of your week. Kim and Luis, I will see you tomorrow. Um, I mean, uh, real nice. Slackers. <laughs>
get out of here. Go plan, go plan your conspiracy somewhere else away from me because then I'm an accomplice. How many times have I told you I can't be an accomplice? <laughs> All right, guys, we'll see you later. Bye. Bye, guys. Celsius.